City's Communications Department, and welcome to Alderman at Work. Today's guest is newly elected Alderman at Large, Stephanie Hirsch. Uh, Alderman Hirsch is originally from northern Wisconsin, um, and she moved to Somerville in 2004. Uh, she worked for the city of Somerville um, and helped in establishing programs like 311, Res ResuStat, which is near and dear to my heart, <laughs> and the Summerstat Department. Um, she's also done a lot of data-centered work with the Somerville Public Schools. And Alderman Hirsch lives with her family in Union Square. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so uh, having been newly elected, um, you're just kind of starting to get into your work on the Board of Aldermen. Um, but I wanted to kind of back up and talk a little bit about um, your decision to run for the board and, and kind of uh, what the campaign was like. So what uh, kind of inspired you to, to run? Uh, so as you mentioned, I've been working um, in Somerville since I moved here in 2004. And um, I've had a chance to do so many different um, positions in Somerville. Mm -hmm and um, which has been great and I appreciate the city administration and the district administration for having those opportunities to continue to contribute. Uh, there were some issues that I was never able to figure out how to fix mm -hmm. over all those years and I also had done many of the different jobs that I, that I thought I would be best at and um, make the biggest impact and so I didn't want to move I didn't want to move my work life to another community um, and so I said, this is another way that I can contribute. I kind of like the idea of having all of my eggs in one basket, <laughs> which as I'm sure you know from living and working here, it's kind of like the highs are very high, <laughs> the lows are very low. So if things are going well in Somerville, especially as a constituent services person. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, um, uh, yeah, once um, uh, a long, long, like 25 years ago, somebody told me that he, he lived in St. Paul, this guy. Um, and he said, my life dream is to do every job in St. Paul, because I love St. Paul so much. I want to <laughs> be a postal carrier. I want to run a coffee shop. I want to be a teacher. I want to ride a, drive a bus. And I, that, that idea always stuck with me that instead of uh, picking a career and then changing positions to follow that career, you mm -hmm. could pick a place and, and over time do more and more different functions within that place. That's an interesting approach. So when you were looking at running, um, how did you decide on alderman at large versus a ward alderman or school committee or mayor? Uh, um, the alderman at large is, uh, is an interesting position because it allows me to run, uh, it allowed me to run a citywide campaign. So I had set aside a year to work on campaigning and um, and so I did have that opportunity to, to spend that year listening to people and um, and it was nice to have a, a campaign that wasn't a head-to-head -head matchup as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that really some of the pressure with campaigning, honestly. And um, I also thought Marion Houston was, a, was an awesome ward alderman. Um, so, but it was really a fantastic experience, especially given how much turmoil there is on the national stage right now. Mm -hmm. um, to just literally my only assignment for the year was to listen. And you know, it's it's both. It's just eye-opening. It was it was a tremendous burden to take on actually to listen to people's stories, and to think about the world from their perspective and their, their the scope of their issues. They're extremely hard to to solve, okay. and it was uh, very common that I would talk to somebody and I would then I would literally have to go around the corner, sit on a curb, and just cry. <laughs> like you know, and even over very kind people like. The, the, these kind of acts of kindness, sure. uh, expressions of kindness in the world that seem so troubled, just like overwhelm me. Yeah, um, and so just if, if folks don't uh, quite understand the position um, on the board of aldermen, there are seven ward aldermen who represent uh, neighborhoods around the city and then four at large, so you're representing the city yes, as a uh -huh. whole. So as you mentioned, you, you took a, a year to kind of go around the whole city um, and talk to folks. So what was that like? What did that entail? Uh, so it's canvassing is you know it's really um, a, it's like grueling <laughs> it's like physically a lot of emotional <laughs> yeah and, and kind of in the heat of the summer and uh, you know it's funny I I tr I I couldn't. I didn't necessarily know there was a place to go to the bathroom, and so then I wouldn't drink that much <laughs> water, like liquid. <laughs> so then I'd go like five hours later, I'd be just 
struck and struck by a terrible migraine because I couldn't. <laughs> I hadn't. <laughs> well, logistics you don't you don't think about. No, you don't. But uh, yeah, so it's a real grueling experience just listening, talking, and there there are funny times where I would be door knocking, <clears throat> and and for whatever reason, maybe it was you know July and nobody was home because they're all on vacation, or it was during the day, and I'd go like seven houses in a row, nobody was home. And then I'd knock on the eighth door, and I would be kind of a, a little zoned out by then. And then the door would swing open, and <laughs> I would be so startled. And the person would say, "What? Why? Why are you surprised? You, you're in my door." <laughs> and then I had to like, <laughs> but it was really, really interesting and fun just to, to have that excuse and and commitment to go and just to, like I say to ask people of all different walks of life. Uh, it was what you know, I asked them, what, what are you worried about? What's on your mind? And um, their responses, they're just so varied. And they range from things happening in that um, family's household to city to citywide to state and national and international. And some of the most kind of moving um, responses were some of like a, a widower. Uh, it was on um, Fremont Street, and I remember him really clearly because I live on Fremont Ave, which is in Union Square and only has about six households on it. And this, and then I got to visit Fremont Street, which is um, the most kind of forest north part of Winter Hill. Um, beautiful street of like little houses on a very, very steep hill. Mm -hmm. And this widower knocked on his door, an old man of about like 87. You can tell their ages from the um, voter mm -hmm. files. And he's, and I said, "What's on your mind? What are you, what are you worried about?" And he said, "Honestly, the only thing I'm worried about that's on my mind is." The loss of my wife from two years ago. I just can't. Oh. I can't think about anything else. He said. Oh. <laughs> that was one right. Like a very, <laughs> so a very honest like, answer. Yeah. So you know, people struggle with so much from sure. all different aspects, and and that, of course, you can't do much about losing a spouse, but you can do things about building up social supports and reducing isolation. Um, people lost to the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. You know, there's things we can do about that. Yeah. Yeah, so what were some of the most common things you, you heard about? Um, affordability was definitely top the, the list, but it means sure. something really different to people in different situations. Mm -hmm. So there were longtime homeowners who owned their property and really could be sitting, you could be living in an asset that's worth close to a million dollars, but had very limited um, income coming in. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were kind of worried about those daily fees and fines, um, the cost of living. and. Um, to you know, renters who have a very well, very low chance of being able to get into the market at all, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those renters kind of are on average likely to be um, have high earning potential. So a lot of our renters are young professionals mm -hmm. who maybe someday will make more. And then there are some renters who are low income, and they really are the most vulnerable. And a lot of those families also have children mm -hmm. who are in the school system. So that kind of touched my heart the most because I've spent a lot of time around children, but in the schools especially. But they, um, those households are in a special position of being extremely dependent on the city because for a child, like going to school is it's their a big whole world. resource. Yeah, It's like all their social network, their, where they spend all their time, their, their future. And so moving just across the line to Medford would be mean changing their whole Especially if a child has like an IEP or some kind of mm -hmm. like where they've found something that works for them. Um, so that was a real, that's a re that's really like the kind of, um, the other two categories I think there's more options because they have some kind of assets, either earning potential or this like literal asset. Right. Um, but this one group really, yeah, and I just was really struck um, just yesterday or the day before it, uh, Everett said that they are laying off lots of teachers, which is, yeah. Really troubling, especially because um, with our Genziano school, where I have the most connections, mm -hmm. almost all of our children who got displaced due to um, income ended up going to Everett. Uh, and the, the more that Everett doesn't have the resources to help them, it's, it's harder to understand how they can continue the plans that help them succeed. Right. Um, so, so as you said, you know, affordability kind of means different things to different yeah. groups of people. Um, so how are you thinking about trying to address that now as an alderman? Um, and you know different approaches and, and those different constituencies. Um, there's a uh, kind of a, a suite or package of solutions. Most of them are pretty hard, and I was really happy to hear the mayor lay out his 10-point plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could have even probably been a 15-point, or yeah. <laughs> like you communication staff probably had to figure out how to organize <laughs> points. Uh, those are the right things to, to try. 
Um, a number of them require state approval that includes a right of first refusal that will allow <coughs> A tenant, so I, I don't know if you rent, but so if you, if you if any for anybody who rents, that would give them an opportunity. If, if your landlord decides to sell, the tenant would have an opportunity to purchase before at, at a fair market value. So mm -hmm. it also protects the seller um, before another um, buyer comes in, yeah. and they can also assign the right to a nonprofit um, developer who can preserve the, the unit as permanently affordable. Yeah. And I think this is really important um, because it's even if somebody has the resources, it's very hard to out to win a bidding war with sure. an investor who can pay, as everybody knows, who can pay a cash offer. And um, there are, you know, as as triple deckers and two families turn over um, a tenant who might have been in a unit with a landlord who really cared about them, they had a relationship with at that property sells, and those people, um, you know, will, will end up losing that. Yeah. Um, any other, you know, I know affordability is, is kind of the, the top issue yeah. um, that, you know, we're hearing about. I know all the aldermen um, that we've talked about on previous shows, yes. that's, that's been a huge topic. Yeah. Um, other issues? Yeah, the other <coughs> things you're hearing from folks about? or Yeah, so I just want to say one more thing about oh, sure. affordability, yeah. which I hope to work on with the city, is that um, to especially address these seniors who have an asset but, mm -hmm. but are income poor, they don't have much money coming right. to the door, is that they are, many of them are eligible for a tax deferral program mm -hmm. that allows them to forgo paying taxes until they transfer their property. And that's a, a, a tool that we already have in place that doesn't really cost the city much, so it's just a matter right. of getting the word out. Yeah. Um, but other issues, um, it was funny how striking in the Ward 1 area, mm -hmm. it was universal across, like, they might have voted for Trump or Sanders or Clinton, <laughs> but they <laughs> told these amazing stories about rats. It was, yep. <laughs> it was so funny. And then I was like, you know, like one woman said, she said, I just was standing on my porch and I saw the rat walking down the street and it was looking at me and I was looking at it. <laughs> Some of them have personality, yeah. <laughs> they had great stories to tell. And then one person said that she had a cat who was able to kill all of the rats in the backyard and I was like, look <laughs> Kind of wow. cat. My cat wouldn't even go near. Yeah, I think I think mine would be afraid of, of some of the rats. <laughs> yeah, and then another person said, uh, <clears throat> "Yeah, you want to see? I got like six rats in this tra my trash bin right now. Come, come take a look." Oh gosh. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> right. So the qual some of the quality of life issues, mm -hmm. even though um, you know they don't they they may it's kind of apples and oranges in terms of like okay we may be worried about nuclear war <laughs> very very <laughs> stressful hard to sure. sleep at night on the other hand. You know, you go out, you want to sit on your back porch and, like, have a glass of wine with your partner or your whatever, grandma, and uh, then you have to see rats scurrying across the backyard. And it, it's upsetting in a different way, but it still really weighs on people's minds. And, and another issue like that is the volume of traffic. Um, mm -hmm. So if you kind of look at a map, you can see all these cut-through routes um, in all different parts of the city. And, they're, they're, and we know from the city traffic um, data that in places like Union Square, 80%, so 8 out of 10 cars at rush hour, as you know, probably from Resi Stat, there's probably yeah. a slide on it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and living in Union Square, I've, yeah. I've definitely experienced it. So that uh, the vast majority of cars traveling through our square don't, you know, they come from somewhere else, they're going somewhere else, they don't even stop at Star, you know, Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts for a coffee or, you know, much less a local restaurant. And yeah. It's important to talk about that, I think, because as I was door knocking, there was a tension between bikers and um, drivers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but if we could reduce our cut through traffic by even 20%, we would have a whole lot more room to, to share the road. Right. Again, yeah. uh, from. Um, and then other issues I care a lot about are community institutions, mm -hmm. um, like our, our recreation department. Um, I'd love to see a new either YMCA or recreation department. Um, like building uh, spaces for kids and tweens and teens and adults and seniors and young professionals to all join together and <laughs> yeah yeah space is always uh, an issue too yeah and then the last thing is um, I'm interested in community building mm -hmm. both so people can form friendships and also so that neighborhoods <coughs> or people interested in a particular issue can organize to try to um, advocate for the things that they care about yeah. Um, so as you were going around, you mentioned, you know, in Ward 1 you heard a lot about rats. Did you notice kind of each neighborhood had <coughs> some of its its own things, its own personality? 
Yeah, um, sure, sure it is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you saw it, but I made a, I coded all, I took notes on every interaction that I had, and then I basically converted the, I coded those notes. So I categorized those mm -hmm. notes, and I, um, and then I made it into a Wordle by Ward. So yeah, there was, um, yeah, it was funny that the east side was definitely focused on rats and traffic. Um, Union Square was all traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think it's because there's been a lot of disruption because of there's new development, um, right. as well as it's an area that's, that experiences a lot of cut through yeah. traffic. Affordability was kind of across the cities, the city in general. Um, yeah, there was, it was funny. And, you know, Ward 3 had a lot of super kind of lefty intellectuals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you go door knocking in Ward 3 that they would say something like, well, I'd like to see your 10-point plan for this and point subpoints and stuff like that. And what's the academic theory that you know, other people were just super friendly in? Right, yeah. Um, did anything really, like, surprise you or kind of jump out at you? Uh, just, you know, I'm, I, I mean, just a recurring theme is that people don't, agree, don't see the city in the same way. Mm -hmm. That uh, there's some points that are common across the community and then there's like big differences and it's a point it's something that kind of weighs heavily on my mind mm -hmm. i don't um think that i um so i'm from as you mentioned i'm from rural wisconsin mm -hmm. which is you know about 50 50 democrats and republicans and i and ha and i you know has a great history of being populist progressive mm -hmm. Um, spending a huge amount of money on our state education system, no kids go to private schools, so there is no like intellectual elite really yeah. in Wisconsin. And that level, that kind of big, big middle income group, everybody invested in the community, that's my ideal community. And I find it troubling to see divisions mm -hmm. and I, you know, um, I think we have to work to find the co the points of agreement and to, to reframe an issue so that there's it's the, we can find more um, support across groups for it. Um, so, like the e example of the traffic, mm -hmm. you know, like is it bikes or is it cars? Well, okay, can we reframe it? It's actually the volume of traffic which is caused by the highway, the, the state or the regional highway system, yeah. you know, um, and you know. Something I found among the seniors that I talked to, <coughs> you know, uh, they, they, many, many, or most, one of their most common points of concern was that feeling that the community was, that they were, had fewer community ties. Mm. <coughs> so that's a really wonderful, positive concern in a way, because that's something that, you know, is perhaps the most commonly expressed wish in Somerville is community. Like mm -hmm. we live here because we're people watchers. We don't mind right. listening to our neighbors conversation. You yep. know, like <laughs> we like to like look out the window and see what's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so if we can find, all right, so you care about, you know, the seniors, you care about community ties and these young people who live on your block, they want to stay, right? And so a solution that would work for everybody is helping the young people stay and provide, f find a permanent, a way to stay permanently because it creates more neighborhood stability and then you can form those connections over time. So like how can we find those kind of points of overlap and, and, and agreement? That's what I'm, I'm wondering. But that, so as I talk to people, this a level of disagreement and also looking for those common mm -hmm. themes and trying to blend those two, that's, that's the real, that seems like the the work that I that I that touches my heart. Yeah. Well, cause I was going to ask, you know, how you were thinking about sort of dealing with, um, you know, <coughs> representing a, a large, uh, yeah, diversity of constituents and uh, people who are going to feel sort of differently on issues. Um, but it sounds like you know you kind of want to look at um, how you can get folks to at least focus on you know the, the things that they agree about or, or really care yeah. about. Yeah, I think it is extremely hard. <laughs> I yeah. just, every day I'm learning more and more how, how hard that is. Right. But I don't want anybody to say, there's a group of people that we're not gonna worry about anymore. I think every voice matters. And I'm gonna, even if I'm in the, even if we have the votes to do something, sometimes I'm gonna say, slow down, let's check. Um, even if it's not popular and um, I, I want there, I want those, I think everybody matters, you know. Um, so now a lot of your work um, with the city and, um, it, as you mentioned, you, you know, even uh, on your campaign, taking a lot of notes, uh, making wordles and charts, uh, is really data focused. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so how did you get into kind of that approach to things? <clears throat> uh, it, um, so to, uh, hopefully this isn't a long story, but we're in, in this community I grew up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, uh, it is a very functional community in my, in my opinion, and um, so there was like a really strong investment in community infrastructure, like a YMCA, a children's theater, a community theater, like museums, etc. And then after college, I worked in really low-income communities that were struggling, mm -hmm. and I could see that there was a, like the, the difference between Eau Claire and the places that I worked was so stark, and I got interested in how you measure, um, how do you like quantify these social connections, because if you can understand what the, what the if you can quantify them, maybe we can change the amount of investment. And so I got, I got interested in kind of this life mission of saying, how do you use um, data analysis and an understanding of resource allocation to change people's life outcomes and the strength of a community? And um, that's how I kind of tried to marry this like social um, mission with, with an, an analytical thinking. Um, so you started the Resi Stat program um, when, when you were working for the city, and I am now the Resi Stat yes. coordinator. Um, so one of the things that I, I have noticed, so uh, you know, uh, the the original goal of Resi Stat and something we, we try to do is to share statistics, you know, get yeah. residents involved with the the data. Um, and one of the the things that I notice is there's there's always a bit of this challenge, um, sort of getting people engaged with it and and um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things um, that I know, you know, when my colleagues in Summerstat look at numbers, you know, they find a lot yeah, of things that right. you, you might not notice. Um, but when you, you kind of talk to people who aren't doing that day to day, um, it can be a little hard to, yeah, to definitely. win them over and get them engaged. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how much of that um, was part of your campaigning, but, um, you know, did you have to kind of deal with sort of <coughs> winning people over and, and kind of getting them interested in that kind of work? I think the hardest, and you can tell me what you think, but I think the very hardest piece of sh sharing the story is helping people understand resource constraints. Mm -hmm. sure. So especially in like, so in city government, we know we have these functions like putting out fires, bingo with seniors, child care, <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> serving meals at schools, plowing snow. So you say, okay, well, why can't we plow more snow? Like, well, you know, why can't we move this snow? To the well, we know in 2015, we spent almost $8 million on snow removal. So yeah, you could probably remove every flake of snow, but it would be very expensive. You might not be able to do anything else, but it's very hard for people to understand that there's a, every decision we make about resources, something else doesn't get spent or we raise taxes. Mm -hmm. That, that there is no other way that this can work. And so I think any tools that you guys can do as you go out and tell the story of ResiSet or that I and the other aldermen and the mayor and any of these ambassadors of the city to help people understand, do you want, um, you know, I, I think I, I calculated there's 1,300 intersections in Somerville. Oh, wow. So do, if we, do we want an extra um, 10 of those shoveled out uh, at the next snowstorm or do we want, you know, one month of after school programming for an at risk child? Or do we want, you know, like one eighth acre more of open space? Or do we want, you know? <laughs> yeah, you can kind of start quantifying some right. of those but things it's so and comparing weird. them. Yeah. I mean, we don't, like, we're not used to thinking in that way because it doesn't really make any sense. You right. know, but that is basically the, that is the math of it. There is no, you know, we continue to be as a community one of the lowest per capita revenue cities. Mm -hmm. We don't have the money to spend, and that will increase as some of this groundwork pays off, um, but it, we continue to not have much money to spend, and it's just a tra it's about trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you and, and your colleagues got sworn in uh, to the board on January 1st, uh, right off the bat. Um, and I know, now you've had a, a couple of meetings and you've started going um, with your committee assignments and, and doing some work there. Um, so what are uh, some of the issues you're planning on, on getting to work uh, right away? On, um, yeah, a bunch of the affordability ones are queued uh -huh. up. Um, uh, there's the zoning is going to take lots and lots and lots of time. Sure, and it, that, that definitely intersects with the, the affordability conversation. Yeah, and, and yeah. quality of life and some others. Um, it's, it basically a prop, uh, affects everybody's property and property value, so it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of people take interest. Um, 
uh, yeah, I've, I've put in a bunch of orders related to, to children and families because that was an interest area of mine, mm -hmm. um, like kind of trying to beef up our recreation department if we can. In fact, the, the, I, I chaired a group that, or staffed a group that did, came to, um, out with all kinds of recommendations for, for um, spending more on recreation. Mm -hmm. And then that was, came out right in um, December, in, um, the, the, the December of 2014, I guess the summer, the winter of 2015, when we had that $8 million. <laughs> yeah, kind of kind of shifted yeah, things a little. Like, yeah, so all these ideas got uh, um, really supportive of the city just put in for um, more staff for, for staffing, um, staff for traffic um, and construction oversight. Mm -hmm. um, people are very frustrated about that, and sure. I think it's a function of um, not having enough resources to to manage these extraordinary, like an explosion, basically, of new projects. As I think Tim Snyder was saying, he said, Somerville is a city of 80,000 people that thinks it's a city of 800,000 people. So the amount of high stakes projects queued up is just, it's amazing, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that's going to be a big part of um, your work in, in the coming yeah. months and, and years. Uh, there are a lot of really big projects that are going to really kick into gear um, yeah. that uh, you know people have a lot of interest in. There's going to be a lot of engagement around, uh, as well as I'm sure their own sets of, of issues. and. Yeah, I found it to be about, I was just calculating, it's at least a 60 hour a week job so far. And when I send out I uh, reply to five emails and then I get like 10 in response and then I <laughs> reply to those 10 and I get 15. <laughs> yeah, yep, there's you know, a lot of meetings and yeah, in interacting with uh, with constituents and yeah. hearing from them. Um, great, well thank you so much oh, for, for, uh, for joining us and uh, we hope you join us next time for the uh, next edition of Alderman at Work. Mm -hmm.